Morning Confirmands, so glad you are with me this morning. This may be another morning where a lot of you guys are watching the video because you're either heading off to spring break or coming home from spring break, but I hope wherever you are, you've had a good time and either you're coming home feeling refreshed or you're heading off ready to feel refreshed. Um, let me take a, let me pray real quick and then we'll get started with the lesson. Father God, thank you so much for who you are and what you do. Thank you for giving us the ability to go off and find times of rest, times when we can get away. Um, and thank you, Father, um, for these next two weeks. Not everybody loves history. Not everybody um, finds this to be really super fascinating, but it is so important for the Confirmands to understand this link, that this church at St. Andrew goes straight back to Jesus and that there are um, direct links back to him um, and how this church, how St. Andrew came to be. So I hope that I will be able to make it interesting enough so that um, they find some value in it. And they understand that even though you lived uh, 2000 years ago, we still have a direct link to you. I ask all these things in Jesus name. Amen. All right, let me um, share my screen. So I can tell you about 412. <laughs> All right, hold on a second, friends. There we go. All right. Scoot me out of the way. Okay. So uh, this week for 412, we are having 412 tonight and we are playing kickball out in the park. It's going to be sort of a tailgate. So there is a sign up to bring food. If you don't happen to sign up and you still want to bring food, please do. Um, but we will be out in the park. If for some reason the weather is not good, we'll um, move inside, but it's supposed to be nice. Bring a jacket. It's supposed to be a little bit cool, but we will play kickball, hang out and um, eat at the same time. So I hope you guys can be there. If you haven't been to a 412 yet and kickball is something you like to do, I'd really encourage you to come so that you can get an idea of what um, 412 is all about. It's not just confirmands, it's sixth and seventh graders as well. And remember, you can always bring a friend. They don't have to be a St. Andrew person to come to 412. We want everybody to come and have fun. So it'll start at 530 and it'll go till 630 um, tonight. So I hope to see you guys there. All right. Well, for the next two weeks, we're going to be talking about this link between um, Jesus and St. Andrew. And I think it's important for you guys as confirmants to understand that there is this direct link that um, Jesus just didn't happen. And then all of a sudden, St. Andrew decided to start a church, that there is this link throughout history. And so much of what the early disciples were told by Jesus and how he wanted to grow his church is still active applicable to us today here at St. Andrew. Um, and so I think that link is really important. So today I'm dividing it up into two weeks. Today we're going to be talking about um, a sort of church history from Jesus up until John Wesley, who's the founder of the Methodist Church. And then next week we'll talk more specifically about the Methodist Church and how the Methodist Church started and then how, you know, St. Andrew came about. So let uh, get, let's get started. So how did the church start? Well, if you guys um, in scripture, we learned that Jesus um, during his ministry over and over told his disciples that he was not going to be around for a long time and that he was going to be depending on them to spread his, his gospel, spread the message of um, what Jesus did for us and that by accepting his gift of grace that people could you know, fix this um, break that's in that relationship with the, in their relationship with God, which we talked about the last couple of weeks. And so he, he it was going to be on the it was going to be the responsibility of his disciples to start growing this church. And then as they started um, converting believers, then those believers would be responsible for sharing the gospel with the people that they knew. So it starts with Jesus. He's the first one. And before Jesus ascended into heaven, so this is after his crucifixion, after he died, after he was resurrected, he was with his disciples for 40 days, um, where he walked and talked and sort of gave his last, um, um, instructions to his disciples. And one of the last things that he said to them was go and make disciples throughout the world. And so again, it was this um, mission that he put them on that now that he wasn't going to be there anymore, he was going back into heaven to be with the father, that it was up to his disciples and hit the believers um, in him to spread the news. 
So it starts with Jesus, and then he commissions his 12 disciples to make more disciples. And then in Acts 1.15, which is the first book that comes after the Gospels, it goes Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts. And the book of Acts is all about the very beginning of the church. Peter, um, who Jesus had said, you will be the rock on which my church is built. Peter was going to be the one that the foundation, sort of the extra special disciple that the church would be built on. Peter stood up in front of a group of people numbering about 120. So at this point, there is, is Peter, the disciple, talking to about 100 people, 120 people. And then at the day of Pentecost, when we learn about when the Holy Spirit comes, another thing that Jesus told his disciples that after he left, after he went back up to heaven, he would, he would send a counselor or a friend, which was his way of saying the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit would help them to make these disciples. The Holy Spirit would give them opportunities and the courage and the words. He would provide them with everything they would need to spread the gospel, and the Holy Spirit came down on believers on the day of Pentecost, and in Acts 2.41, it says those who accepted his message, meaning the message of Jesus, were baptized, and about 3,000 people were added to their number that day, so we go from Jesus, who's one, to the 12 disciples, to the 120, and now on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people are believers and are baptized, and all of those people go out and start telling other people about Jesus, and this is how the word spreads. This is how the gospel spreads, and it's exactly the way the gospel spreads today, right? You're a believer. You start talking to your friend about how much Jesus means to you or how much you like coming to church and how this is a place that's accepting of everybody, and then they start getting interested, and maybe they start coming to church. Um, and when your parents raise you, um, they are, when you are baptized, they're committing to tell you about Jesus and to, to bring you up in a household where Jesus is the center of things, all because they want you to someday accept that message of Jesus too. So once you become a believer, you are um, one of these people who is supposed to help spread the gospel. We are to go make disciples of other people. And in the early church, that's exactly what they did. Well, for about a thousand years, the church kept growing. Now, remember, this is all in that area of around um, the Mediterranean. So um, Rome and Greece, Italy and Greece and um, uh, Israel and all of that area. And it started growing out from there. But there are some notable events that happen in the life of the church. And you guys need to know about those. The first one comes in 312 AD. So this is about 300 years after Jesus um, has left his disciples. Rome is still the reigning power of the day. They um, have conquered lands that go all the way up um, to Britain um, and all across the um, European continent and some of North Africa. And Constantine is the emperor of Rome. Up until that point, Christians, for the most part, were persecuted, right? The, the Jews who rejected Jesus persecuted other Jews who converted to Christianity because they had rejected Jesus as the Messiah, and so therefore persecuted the people who accepted Jesus as the Messiah. And for Constantine and the Romans and all the people who are in charge, their main focus is to stay in power. They don't want to have anybody else um, competing for the power that they have to control the people and to control the land. And when they start hearing about this king, this person who um, the people who believe in this in Jesus are supposed to spoke, excuse me, are supposed to devote their life to that to him and not to the emperor, that starts to make the Romans nervous. So for the first 300 years, Christianity is really a persecuted religion. They have to be very careful where they worship. They have to be careful how they talk about Jesus. They have to, they're subject to being beaten, to being put in jail. If, if the Romans think that they are putting Jesus above the emperor, um, which we should always do, right? God and Jesus always come first. But in 312, Constantine, who was the emperor of Rome, actually converts to Christianity. Some of this is done because of, there's a picture of um, Constantine or a, a sculpture of him. Um, what happens is that uh, Constantine's mother, Helen or Helena, um, is a, a believer and her influence um, 
goes on to Constantine and he becomes a believer too. And the moment he um, converts, he makes Christianity actually the religion of the land. So almost overnight, Christianity goes from this religion that's persecuted and you have to hide it, you have to be very careful about it, to being the, the religion of the land, just because Constantine, the emperor of Rome, has had this conversion in his heart. The other interesting thing about um, Helen is that she was such a believer um, and she felt so strongly about Jesus and who he was. She takes a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. And when she gets to the Holy Land, she decides she is going to go around and ask everybody where all these things happened in Jesus's life that she's heard about. Where did he give the Sermon on the Mount? Where was Bethlehem? Where did he live in Nazareth? Where was he crucified? All of these places um, that she heard about through scripture, she wanted to know exactly where they were. And since this was only 300 years later, they were able to show her, just like we are, you know, almost 300 years away from the Revolutionary War. And we can go back and say, well, this is where the first shot was fired. And this is Yorktown where the British surrendered um, because people have um, known where those places were. That's what Helen did in the Holy Land. So if ever you get a chance to go to Israel, when you go to these places, the reason archeologists and, and, and theologians believe that these places are truly where these things happened, it's because of what Helen did. Um, around 300. She went and documented where they were so everybody would know. And those um, that documentation has stayed um, constant throughout time. And so that's why we know today where all of these things really happened. So Constantine looks kind of like an intimidating guy here, but gives his heart to Jesus, becomes a Christian, and, and makes Christianity the um, religion of the land. And because, as I mentioned, uh, the Roman occupation goes all over Europe, this allows Christianity to spread really fast because they have conquered all of these places. And so once it's okay to talk about Jesus and to worship him and to spread the new good news, um, it spreads all over um, at that time, which you know can be considered the known world, um, the, uh, the known European world, I guess is probably a better way to put it. All right, so that's Constantine. Then we know go another 700 years um, and there's this other huge split in the church. And what happens is up until this time, the Roman Catholic Church based in Rome is the, the, the church um, that everybody you know, is a part of. It's still one church. And um, some of um, the people start having disagreements about a few things. The main thing they have a disagreement about in, at this time is that the Pope, who is the head of the church, the head of the Roman Catholic Church, has decided that he has universal jurisdiction over everything. So anywhere in the Christian world, whatever he says goes. And there are groups of people who don't believe in what he is demanding of people or, or his interpretation of scripture or his interpretation of what Christianity should be. And so they make this split. And the split is really a split between the East and the West. And so we have the split in the church. The West sticks with the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church. And in the East, um, which is mostly um, the Greeks and people to the east of there, if you look at a map, um, and they become the, um, the Orthodox Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church. And that gets eventually in time divided into the Greek Orthodox Church, the Russian Orthodox Church, you know, all of these um, different churches. And while they still believe in Jesus and they still have the same main theology, how they express their faith and their traditions and how they do things is very, very different. And so if you've ever been to an Orthodox church, they are really big on um, incense and everything is very um, ornate and beautiful. Um, they believe greatly in icons, which is um, pictures of Jesus and Mary and other saints that have come before. And there's almost this worshiping um, feel towards these icons, these people, um, these paintings of, of great people of the faith. Um, and so there, it's a very different um, feel from what we are more familiar with. And that's because Methodism comes out of the Western tradition of the Catholic Church. 
But this, again, this is a huge, huge split in the Christian church. All right, so the next thing that happens, the next big thing that happens is 500 years later. So all of this stuff takes place over a really, really long period of time. And at this time, it's in the early 1500s. And what happens is people, again, are having a little trouble with the Catholic Church and especially with the Pope. Um, again, in the Western um, religion, the, the Western split of Christianity, the Pope and the Catholic Church are still the main um, uh, church. And really up for 1500 years, whatever the Pope, whoever the Pope was at that time, whatever he said goes, everybody does what the Pope says, because the Pope, the Pope is believed to be, even to this day, God's representation on earth. But one of the things that over time has happened is the Pope has, the Popes have decided that the way to earn forgiveness is to pay the church, that if you pay the church for um, and if you pay the church something, then the, then the Pope and you will be forgiven of your sins. And it starts to become this transaction of you have to pay the church in order to be forgiven. And at this time, um, another big thing that happens at this time is the printing press starts. So um, they have figured out a way to print things. They print the Gutenberg Bible. Up until then, the only literate people um, in the world were mostly monks and people like that who would handwrite the scripture and the Pope would know it. And because normal lay people, for the most part, couldn't read and they couldn't read scripture, they certainly couldn't read Latin. Um, what would happen is that the Pope would tell them what the scripture says and interpret it the way he wanted to. But there was nobody who could read it for themselves and say, well, that's not really what it says, or I don't think that's how this should be interpreted. But with the printing of uh, the printing press being invented and Bibles starting to be printed, not only in Latin, but also in English, people started to be able to read scripture on their own. And they were able to look at it and say, wait a minute, it doesn't say anything in here about how we need to pay the church to be able to be forgiven. All scripture says is we should just go to God and ask for forgiveness and he should give it to us. So this idea, this ability to be able to interpret scripture for themselves because people could start reading it um, led was one of the reasons that led to this reformation, this Protestant and, and Protestant comes from the word protest, right? You see the word protest in there and they were protesting against all of these rules that the Catholic church had put into place and they didn't believe that scripture really reflected what those rules were. There are two people in um, specifically who um, were a huge part of this reformation. One is Martin Luther. The other one is a man named John Calvin. And Martin Luther famously wrote up 95 theses, um, sort of uh, ways of arguing back to the Catholic Church about what their policies were and why they were wrong based on scripture. And he was so adamant that people would be able to know them and understand what he was trying to say. He nailed them to the door of a cathedral in um, Germany so other people could read them. And this is what started the Protestant Refor Reformation. And what that means is the break between the Catholic Church and the Protestant, um, um, other Protestant religions and denominations is that this, this is break. And in that break, Protestants start to believe that they don't have to listen to what the Pope says, that they can just accept the grace of Jesus on their own. They are able to read scripture, interpret it for themselves. They don't need the Pope telling them what to do or how it should be interpreted. They, you know, people begin to believe that they can do that themselves. And that's the main, the main breaks um, between the Catholic Church and the Protestants. They don't want to have to live under the rule of the Pope and all of the rules that the Catholic Church have. All right, so not long after that, we have one more sort of big event that happens, and that's just a few years later, we have Henry VIII. Some of you guys might know Henry from history. He was the British king, and Henry VIII badly wanted to have a male heir to pass on the throne to. At that time, women were not allowed to rule um, England. It had to be a boy, a, a male. And um, uh, Henry had a really hard time um, getting a boy. And so he, if he married somebody, a wife, and she did not produce a male heir, he either killed her by chopping off her head, or he wanted to divorce her so he could move on to another woman who would give him a male heir. 
And so that is why we talk about um, the six wives of Henry VIII, because he constantly was looking for a woman who would give him a son. The Catholic Church would not allow him to divorce for those reasons. And Henry, being king, thought, well, I'm king, I can do whatever I want. Um, and so he also breaks off from the Catholic Church, and he decides, I'll just start my own church. It's going to be called the Anglican Church. I'm going to be the head of the Anglican Church, and I'm going to say that it's okay to divorce your wife especially if she doesn't give you a male heir. And so he starts his own um, church, granted based on very selfish reasons, but he starts his own, the Anglican church on his own in order to get a male heir. Now, for those of you who don't know, he never does get a male heir. His daughter, Elizabeth I, ends up becoming queen because he has no male heirs. And she actually becomes one of the most powerful uh, monarchs that England has ever had. And I believe she rules for one of the longest times until the current queen who's um, surpassed her, um, Elizabeth II has passed the length of time that Elizabeth I reigned. But poor Henry never did get his boy. He ended up with Elizabeth who ended up to be an amazing woman. Just a little side note for you guys. All right, so Henry VIII splits with the Catholic Church. I'm sure he was encouraged when he saw Martin Luther and John Calvin doing it. He decided he could do it too, and he starts the Anglican Church. And it's out of the Anglican Church that we get John and Charles Wesley, who start the Methodist movement in the early 1700s. We're going to talk about them next week. Um, John Wesley's story is an incredible story of faith, an incredible story of his life and how he started this denomination of which St. Andrew is now a part. But again, I wanted you guys to see that our heritage goes straight back to Jesus. Granted, there are these splits, there are these divisions. When people don't agree on how to interpret scripture, they can decide they're going to split off from the church that they know and move and create their own in an effort to be authentically living out the life that they believe God has have called them to do. And this is, well, you know, sort of a... a we have no pictures of John and Charles Wesley, but here they are looking like saints um, there for you. All right, so here are some discussion questions for you guys to talk about. Um, feel free to use your phones or look up on Wikipedia or whatever if there are things you don't know about. How the church has evolved over time is fascinating, but the one thing I want to leave with you today is the reminder that while things have changed and churches have split, the one thing that we all have in common is that um, we believe that Jesus is God's son, that he was fully God and fully human, that he uh, lived and walked on this earth as a human. He died for our sins, and it's through the belief in him and having a relationship with him that our relationship with God, um, broken by sin, is able to be repaired and brought back together. All of the other issues of who should be in charge and how we should interpret scripture have led to all of these divisions, but we do still have this one unifying thought. And if you come across a denomination or a religion where Jesus is not the center, where it is not believed that he is God's son and that he came and died and was truly resurrected, you have, that's a red flag for you to wonder, is this really a, um, a, a true Christian religion or have things been skewed just enough to make them not scripturally sound? We'll talk about more of that next week. Anyway, in the meantime, enjoy the discussion questions. I hope you have a great week, and I look forward to seeing you next week when we talk more about John Wesley. Take care. I love you guys.